Welcome to another episode of Sports and Discourse with your host, Derek Stevenson. And man, on today's episode, man, I got a real special guest, uh, my guy, uh, PJ, uh, Phil Johnson. Listen, um, when this whole Calipari situation popped off, I was very uh, emotional in the beginning of this. Um, it kind of hurt my feelings a little bit, even though um, I was kind of ready for a change. Uh, so I had to fall back for a while. So I just wanted to take a break, chill out and wait and let this roster uh, fill up. Uh, so I was watching this guy a whole lot. Uh, he was giving me a whole lot of information. He was doing a whole lot of Twitter spaces I was listening to, man. So I thought um, it was only right for me to bring him on the show, man. So PJ, man, I appreciate you coming on the show, man. What's good with you, brother? What's up, brother, man? I'm glad to be here, man. I really appreciate it for real. Yeah, for sure, man. So anyways, let's let's get into it, man. So after the season, well, first of all, what was your expectations uh, for that group of Kentucky cats? What did, what did, and let me know if um, you was disappointed or, you know, just give me your feelings yeah. on the team. So you talk about th this past season, right? Yes, sir. Oh, man, listen. So I, I was very vocal about, um, of course, I think the NCAA term is just kind of random. I think you need some luck. You need some things to go your way. But I was I was certain, being honest with you, that we're probably going to make at least the Sweet 16. That's where I was with it because even though we lost the first round of the SEC tournament, um, I actually understood Cal to a degree what he was trying to say. I think a lot of times we can. We're very literal people, so we'll take things literally. Um, but ultimately, I, I, I kind of knew what he was trying to say in a sense, and Cal being Cal. But um, – I don't know. I still feel like, okay, we're going to be full strength going into the tournament. It's a new slate, new opponents, not the same opponents you see for the last, you know, three months. Let's get it rocking, man. And uh, so I was extremely disappointed <laughs> that we lost to Oakland. But like you said, that, you know, had to take a second away. I, I wanted to, at the same time, I'm one of those who are big on like, if I'm going to be here talking trash, I'm going to be here when we lose. You know what I'm saying? Because, you know, you see a lot of Louisville and North Carolina Duke fans who do a lot of that stuff where they just start running away. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I was disappointed for sure, man. Yeah, I, I was too, man. I'm not going to lie to you. There was points during the season where I felt like we got a Final Four team, and then there was points of the season where I felt like we was going to go out in the first round. And um, ultimately, that's what happened, man. So I was definitely disappointed. Um, So... After you heard Calipari have his meeting with Barnhart, did you feel better? Like, how did you feel when when that happened? Because we know there was heat on him right out the gate. He didn't even come back to Lexington for a few days. So, um, first, tell me what you was thinking right after we lost, and then tell me what you thought after you seen the whole sit down with them two. When we lost, I remember writing to a group chat. I pretty much like, man. This might have been the last time we seen John Calipari coach Kentucky because we had kind of already heard the scuttlebutt, right? It had been – everyone kind of knew that the relationship between Mitch Barnhart and um, John Calipari was really on the rocks. The whole football comment of where basketball pro program, which he was correct on, um, <laughs> caused a lot of flack. And it just kind of exposed and put to the light really where the relationships were within the program. Um, I think people don't really understand how much – Dwayne Peavy, who is now the AD at DePaul, how much he was needed or how necessary he was in the relationship process when it comes to Cal and those around, because Cal is definitely a loyalist. And I, I don't think it's wrong how he moves as far as he sticks with people who are loyal to him. I have no disagreement with that at all. But when we lost, and and I, I kind of felt like either two things, either we're about to fire him, which I, if I had said I would hope he would get another chance. You know, get one more shot. I don't believe – I don't believe you just throw away coaches, especially Hall of Fame coaches, like, out of nowhere. That's just not me. Um, I don't think he, he we should have fired him or nothing like that. So when he had the conversation and I heard the scuttle was pretty much – what it sounded like to me was preparation for the next move. And I thought that was the right move. Like, give us time. Like, we're going to give you time to try to reconcile this as well as give us time to try to find – who will be the successor to you? You know what I'm saying? So I thought that was the correct move. And I was kind of, I was with it, man. I I like, I didn't really like the recruiting class that much, but I like certain guys in it. And I thought, okay, if we get these guys back, you get some guys returning, you know, 
we'll be right back here to try to make a noise, but it's going to take a while for the fan base to join in. They probably won't join until March because of you just had this team that was so exciting, that was fun to watch. You know, they checked all the boxes except for defense, <laughs> and you lose to Oakland in the first round. So I can't be mad at fans for feeling the way they did because ultimately I, I want to see guys go to the NBA. I want to see kids be successful, right? I do that professionally. We want to see these kids live their dreams. On the fan side of it, you also want to see your team win. So I definitely understood people being frustrated with the fact that it had been five years and we've only seen one into the tournament win, I think one SEC win. So tournament win. So I, I understood it. Um, but I was very conflicted like you. I'm a big Cal Perry fan. I wanted him when he first, when we first, tell me first left, I wanted John Cal Perry when I was in middle school. I told my friend, I told my cousin Joe Fan, I said, listen, we need to get Cal Perry. Because he was getting all the guys, man. It's like it, it made too much sense. Fortunately, we went with the drunkard. Um, but <laughs> to our grace, you know, uh, the next round, Mitch didn't make the heart the higher uh, outside firm pretty much helped with that. And we got John. So I've been a big fan, man. So I was definitely conflicted with him leaving, but I also understood that sometimes there is a chain of the guard and, you know, it's like, it is what it is, you know, got to embrace it. Yeah. The thing that, that kind of was rubbing me the wrong way was I feel like, I feel like Calipari understood what the fan base wanted from him but he's so stubborn, so stuck in his ways that he couldn't even just lie to us. And that's what he's been known to do is lie to us. But on this, when we tell him, will you please stop coaching for the NBA and coach for us? And he just couldn't even lie to us. He was like, he still was talking NBA stuff even after that. And I feel like that's kind of what made me start to go. I just don't think he's really locked in with winning at Kentucky. Um, how do you feel about when he was still making those comments? I didn't mind it because I think I, on on the back channel of it, you kind of knew what he was doing it for. Now, did the method kind of need, need to be, you know, critiqued and changed? I agree as far as his wording. But pretty much what it was is when Calipari was doing the whole draft pick thing, it was literally meant just for a recruiting tool. His thought process is if I elevate – how much I care about the players, which he does care about the players. I think that can't, that's undeniable to me. Yeah, me um, too. He cares about the players. If I show how, like, coming here with the spotlight, with things we'll do, with the development we'll do in this six-month span of how it can get you to a better position with the draft, it would pretty much recruit itself. And, you know, guys would want to come here. I mean, even now, like, I we got, and we'll get into the roster, we got guys who they grew up, you know, when Cal was here. That's mostly what they remember. And they remember Kentucky being that, that it would be known as an NBA factory to them because John was do Kyle Perry was doing that, right? And that was his way of doing it. So it was a recruiting tool. He absolutely a hundred percent cared about winning. Anyone who doesn't think he didn't is just feeding into the, the rivalry be beast, right? That they want the narrative they want to put out. But he absolutely hundred percent cares about winning. Um, but when you lose, there's only so much like you can really fall back to, right? And yeah. that's that's what you see. You see him always on the defense because of of that, and because we didn't, wouldn't get the results in the postseason, it made it really hard to continue to push that narrative. Because it's cool when you win it. When you go into lead eight, final four, even if you don't win it, like when you win it, it it does like okay, I guess I can rock with this because we're winning. But then when you start losing, you like now you see like okay, we're pretty much the G League right now. Dudes just coming here and waiting for the draft and. You know, so the narrative change changes with winning and losing. Yeah, man. And that's what I actually started to view Kentucky as. I started to realize, I said, man, we just pretty much an NBA showcase. Um, mm -hmm. We giving these scouts just a real, like a season long uh, look. And, um, you know, pretty much we was a draft factory. Um, but yeah, I believe that he, uh, I definitely believe he wanted to win. But I definitely, the thing that I always uh, kind of annoyed me was, I feel like he was so set on teaching the NBA style that he lost so several games, uh, notable games that could have probably preserved his career at Kentucky because just for that one moment, he couldn't get out of that. I'm trying to prepare him for the draft. Um, you know, he, he had several teams that when, you know, when we, and, and look, like you said that, you know, that's, that's one of the hardest championships to win is college basketball because, like you said, it takes a lot of lugs. It takes a lot of uh, 
matchups to be favorable, uh, you know, to how many games they got to win, five or six in a row. Uh, what is it? Six yeah, or something six, like that. Six games in a row. Man, that, that that's that's very hard to do. Uh, so that, it's a tough tournament to win, but I think he's had some teams where he could have potentially made a few adjustments here and there and um, probably could have got himself at least one other championship, if not maybe two. Um, and I think that's the most frustrating part because when you when you see these these moments that we missed out on and then you see him always appear to be so concerned about draft status, draft status, draft status, it's a uh, – you know, it's a little bit frustrating, man. But let's move on from that. Let's let's get to the meat of it, man. How did you feel when we first started looking for coaches? And then tell me how you felt once we uh we came to the conclusion that Mark was gonna be the guy. Yeah, man. I, I made some polls actually in the Beyond the Game group where I just was like, I'm not worried until we get to Mark Pope being the coach. And I was being funny because I'll say this, my friend, I, I, as you know, I'm, like I, we've seen on Twitter, about the Twitter spaces, I have some guys I'm really connected with um, who cover basketball, period. They have their favorites, but they cover basketball, period. A little bit even more in-depth than I am sometimes, right? They inspired me to go more in-depth with some things. And one of my good friends uh, named Kev, um, he said, hey, man, he said, have y'all been watching? This is back in January. He said, have y'all been watching BYU? And I was like, I said, I keep up with the wins and losses because Mark Pope is one of us. You know what I'm saying? Like, same thing I would do when Sean Woods was coaching, McCarty was coaching, like, you know what I'm saying? Even when Pelton, he's him coaching. I'm going to keep up with the Cats. Um, so, I said, I don't really pay attention. said, hey, man, they on some next level stuff. But, of course, it's BYU. So, it's like, so what I'm looking for and I'm watching him in the tournament is based upon what I see in the future. Like, I'm hoping, like, down the line, this could be a guy. Hopefully, he plays into himself and what he coaches himself into being a really good candidate. Not this year. So, I felt what well, everybody felt. Um, in the background, of course, everybody had heard that Scott Drew and Mitch Barnhart were very, very close. He's the guy. He's his pick. Um, and essentially, the way the timeline I put together based upon the chats I've been in and, and the things that have been released by some of the sources and stuff like that and some of the interviews we've done as far as with art with Kentucky is essentially Scott Drew was the first offer. They felt really strong about the offer. <clears throat> Barnhart knew that the timeline was off. And I think also that's what that's why you probably seen him trying to get Cal to extend because they just started building a it was like I think a, a 17,000 square feet square foot home and Waco, like, you know what I'm saying? Things were off, but he knew that Drew was interested to the job. So interested that he flew his wife here. She went to, I believe, I believe they went to LCA to visit him and her and the daughter went there to visit, went back home. They said they prayed over it, much respect for them to that. You know what I'm saying? They said they prayed over it and the answer was no. From there, they went for Dan Hurley, and the Dan Hurley thing was kind of a just throw some poop at the wall, see if it sticks. Yeah. Um, the donors were really big. The people that donate, they were really big on that. Barnhart wasn't. Barnhart wasn't because the scuttle was that Dan Hurley probably has like two, three years max, and he's going. He's trying to get the next job. He wants to the NBA. So. He want, he would get him if he can get him. Of course, anybody would. He's one two, you know, he's one back to back national championships. That's a no brainer. But for Barnhart, this is his last hire for basketball. So he's fully invested. This person has to be a long term. He wants this person to be here at least as long as he's here. Um, and so the next two names were Shaka Smart and 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 Pope. But before that, I I always tell people this because they get it confused. When it came to Alabama and they owe to a lot of people wanted as well, they actually reached out to Alabama first because Mitch Barnhart, of course, works with the NCAA. He's high up there with the NCAA with the committee and stuff like that. So he went about it what he would consider to be the right way. It's an in-conference team. They're going to approach Alabama to see, hey, we want to let you know that we're about to start discussions with your coach. Alabama said, well, just so you know, we're not coming down on the buyout. So that's $17 million. So that was already strike one for Kentucky. Like, eh, we don't know if we want to pay $17 million for Ms. Barnhart. I mean, not for Ms. Barnhart, for Nate Oates. But then also, 
Nate Oates is kind of going through a personal matter that would imply that his heart really wants to stay with Alabama. As far as people on the outside looking in. But the fact that they wouldn't even come out the 17 mil, Kentucky passed over. We're not going to go down that route because we're not paying it out. Now, if I think if it got bad where we was getting a bunch of no's, they would have revisited that conversation because they had the money to do it. It's about do you want to spend it, right? Um, but from there, it became clear that uh, Billy Donovan was one of the guys. Um, Shaka Smart was actually one of the guys they interviewed as well as Mark Polk. Uh, for Billy Donovan, the, again, the timing was off. Bulls is playing in the playing game. They didn't know when that would end. But I'm going to tell people how close this was, and people still disagree, and I understand it. I don't think people are wrong to feel that way, that we should just wait for Billy Donovan. But the thing was, someone very close to Billy Donovan pretty much said, on purpose, his wife is okay with moving. Because the last two coaches, that was the one of the biggest obstacles was the wife. Yeah. So just trying to, like, hey, I can't tell you right now what we're going to do because we're still in the season. I don't want to, you know, shift that spotlight a little bit, but she's okay with all the kids gone. I'm okay with moving to Lexington, you yeah. know? That was actually the hire that I wanted the most. I wanted to say yeah. uh, Billy Donovan. I think he would have he would have kept the recruits rolling like the same way Cal did. Like I I think Billy would have turned up at Kentucky. I do too. I I don't think I think Billy Donovan was a great hire, home run hire. Honestly, to me, um, the only thing I would worry about as far as like people recruits rolling, I feel like it would still take time with him as far as getting back into the game. Um. As late as, as late as it would have been. You know, people would be like, oh, this first year's a wash, and I understand that. But at the same time, <clears throat> if we're actually looking at context, you can't allow first year to be a wash. You yeah. need actually first year to be a, a knock out the park so you can build the credibility that this is still a machine and we're still going to move on type right. thing, right? And so on the projection of it, he would have got the job late when the portal actually closed. He would have, and people don't understand as much as money's involved with the NIO stuff. People cannot, you cannot minimize relationships. That True. still wins off. And we'll get into the roster and about some of the guys who actually, that played a, huge, a big part into it. But, you know, um, when it got down to, I heard Mark Pope, Mark Pope and Shaka Smart with the last one. They, when they mentioned Mark Pope's name, I seen a guy on Twitter actually say, I followed this guy, I'm trying to remember, has used him before and I should have wrote it down. But pretty much he does big spaces where he follows the co coaching carousel and he knows like all the ends about who's, on the block who's not, all this stuff. And he said, I don't really understand Mark Pope in this job. Okay, I found this on the web for it, he said. He said, I don't think you understand how Mark Pope in this Kentucky job actually might have some fire. Because to us, Mark Pope was really, really low on the list. But to Mitch Barnhart, he was right on the next tier after the first guys he offered, the two guys he offered. And it pretty much became between Shaka Smart and Pope and their thought process from what it sounded like was Pope runs a modern NBA offense. It's kind of, it's very, it's high praise by Kelvin Sampson, who's one of the best defensive coaches, bar none right now in the college basketball period. Um, and a lot of other coaches, even Scott Drew and those guys, high praise about, you know, Mark Pope and his offense. So they felt, okay, he fits the, the, that part of it, right? He's a, he's one of us. So we know, even though the whole fan base may not be with it, there's still going to be UK fans who think Mark Pope 96. <laughs> That's what it is, right? And so between that, I think they chose to go with him over Shock and Smart because I think also they believe that if done right, if Mark Pope is successful here, he would be here for a very, very, very long time. Yeah. He's not looking to go to the NBA as they know of. He would be cool selling down here and coaching however long you give him if he's successful. So I tell everybody it's not a home run hire. It's not a home run hire. But I will say this. I've been fortunate to work at a job right now where I'm school's out. I have ample amount of time. I have little things I'm doing at work, but I'm able to like look at film, read on articles. And I do my due diligence because I'm in these other groups, you know what I'm saying? So I'm getting information. I'm check double checking it. And uh while it's not a home run hire, I would give it a, a D in, in, as far as initial hiring. I'll give it a D. But I would say, just like I told little fans, it does not mean it cannot turn into a home run hire. 
And so far, man, like staff wise, what he has done, he's been on it. You know, and I'm gonna get into the roster, man. People are you got people who are higher than others on it, but when you really look into, I really want people to really go do their homework. Look into what he runs. Look into he runs a lot. Of, he runs zoom action. That's his main focus. Zoom action. The staggers he runs, rejections he runs through the offense, the spacing it creates, all the different things. Like he's very analytical about everything, and um, I think the people give him a chance. I think they're really going to enjoy what they what they see from him. Right. So let let's get on into it, man. How do you feel about this roster? Yeah, man. I, I would get, I would give his I would give this a B plus. Okay. Um, and I and the reasons why I'm not in an A is just because we did miss on some guys, which is no one's getting every single guy to go after, right? Um, yeah. we we tried to get we tried to sneak out Jeremy Roach. That that was a whole crazy thing that I've heard. The yeah. whole they were in contact with Jeremy Roach when it leaked out that Kentucky was the school, the price went up. Right. And so what you're going to see differently with this group than you did with Cal is there's not a lot of leaking of information with guys for a while. Unless they feel really confident, nothing really is going to be leaked out that much because they know with Kentucky's name comes a bump in pay. And right. they have the money to do it, but you also have to be smart with your money because, again, people don't understand this money is not just for this year. You have to go for next year and the year after that. So you need to be wise with your money. And it also sets, always also sets president, like as far as like next year, right? If I get a guy for a million dollars this year, next year, I mean, I'm going to get him for, for one and a half, then three. Like, you know what I'm saying? So you want to be smart. So, you know, we missed out on him. We uh, had a point guard that I really enjoyed and liked named Davion Smith uh, from Utah. He pretty much verbal to them, was coming into, you know, literally about to fly out to come do his photos, you know, do the whole ordeal. And they were going to announce not the boom, and you know, uh, so Sandy Bell's like, mm, this ain't going to work. His transcript's not going to go. So he has some academic things that they would have to wait. I think it was like three weeks at the time for him to graduate to see if he could get it to UK. Even though UK, and that says a lot because brother, we have a high acceptance rate. So yeah. <laughs> that says that's a lot, was, bro. That's why I was confused about the whole yeah, thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. So like, it's crazy. So that said a lot, anyway. So. Uh, Lamont Butler was, I think, first of Amari Williams. Let's go with Amari Williams. He started off, um, uh, as I mentioned with Mark Pope, he's very analytical. He knew the the things they didn't have at BYU, right? The players they couldn't get, the style they couldn't play. What you should expect for him to do is play a lot of similar similarities to what you would see with Patino did at UK as far as, it may not be, of course, he's not starting with the same talent, right? That whole team that we had in 96 was absolutely insane. It's not yeah. that, but style of play in the sense that you're going to see the threes, you're going to see good looks, but you're going to also see defense. They're going to switch it up. Zone, man, press, like they're going to switch it up. They're, they're looking to play nine nine to ten guys a game between 18 and 24 minutes, depending on the night. Um, but he had limit, limitations. So what does he do? He goes and gets guys that, one, he had, had relationships with that he felt can fit in the SEC. I always tell people this. There's a reason why Aaliyah Khalifa did not visit UK. It was just because of the red shirting. I think they would have accepted him to come on, but they made it very abundantly clear that we have other guys <laughs> that, that we are after, and we can't allow everybody just to come over here. So I knew there would be like two to three guys they could possibly bring from BYU, but it wouldn't be a lot. So Mario Williams was one of the first ones, 6'11", 7'5", wingspan, defensive player year for three years in a row. It's at Drexel. So, of course, everybody's kind of like, it's at Drexel. But I, I caution people because I'm telling them, like, well, John A. Broom was the same thing at Moorhead State. He came to the SEC, and he's doing the exact same thing or better. So some guys translate really well athletically, and I think Amari does. He he moves the ball. Uh, if you go look at his stats, like advanced stats, man, he was, like, in the 90th percentile in transition buckets as a center. So that tells you how quick, man, how quick he moves to transition. Like when the ball goes to the hoop and the other team scores, he's gone. If he's not the one getting the rebound, he's gone. And he can finish at the rim. That's what it means. You know what I'm saying? So really good at that. He's an underrated passer as well. He has really good passing rate for a big. But, of course, 
seven foot five wingspan, six eleven. He can block shots. He's going to be a rim runner for them pretty much. Um, I don't expect him to be like a big time score or anything like that. Uh, but I expect him to get better offensively because he's going to be more involved with. Um, you'll see a lot of in the zoom action. There's a lot more cuts. There's a lot more action going in this. Some of these guys just did not play in it first. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So we'll get into that as well. But so you go from him. It kind of got silent for a little bit because they were trying to find everybody. I think a lot of recruits were waiting to see who's going to join Kentucky. That's a big thing too with everywhere. I, you think, know what I think that's what was happening too. Man, they were trying to see like, okay, who else is coming because they you know I don't want to go there. Be, yeah. So um, when they found out uh, Smith would be able to transfer pretty much, or they have to wait three weeks, they said we're not waiting three weeks. And you're going to find that that's another thing about them. You're going to find they don't believe in waiting on guys. They feel like they have a guy, unless it's an absolute necessary, they feel like they have a guy that's like this. They're going to take the guy who says yes first every time. And that's what we've been burnt out on. I ain't going to lie. I'm not, again, I'm never here to bash Kyle Perry because I, I love Kyle when he did for UK. So I'm never here to bash Kyle. But that is one of the weaknesses I feel like the staff had is that we were very confident on guys that when we lost him, it showed, i.e., yeah. we had Devin Askew starting point guard. But that's a whole other conversation. But uh, so you know, you had Lamont Butler announce he was in the portal. People don't like him because they say he's not a scorer, but he was getting calls from everybody around the country. Almost every school in the country called this young man, defensive player of the year for his conference, all tourney, all Final Four team, game winning shot, Final Four against FAU to go to the championship game, locked up some guys that other teams have that we're gonna be rivals with. Like he's a good steady um. Captain, high character kid. But as I mentioned with the advanced stats, man, they're really big on looking at things beyond what you see. Like if I go to stats right now, look at the stats, what you see or what I would see, it's like, okay, what they are looking at is different. For instance, like the catch and shoot situation, how he shoots. So for them, okay, he's it's, it may say he's like this percentage on threes, but it says he's this in catch and shoot, which he's going to have a lot of in the offense, right? So they're looking at those type of things. So usage and things like that so that was a big pickup for them because they feel like they got their captain pretty much their team captain if you will um they think he can score better if you look at a guy named Keisha Johnson he played for San Diego State as well coach Dutcher is amazing comes from winning culture but his offense is not like a it's not the thing right so Keisha Johnson played way better for Arizona offensively because they had more pro action they had different things they run some zoom and it just he got better looks overall. And that's how they feel about Lamont. Um, I believe after Lamont was uh Otega always. So Otega from he played o OU, started at OU. He's a he got onto the draft board earlier this year. Kind of fills it off a little bit in conference play. Two-way player, another guy who who they rank amongst like top 20 defense. So clearly the sign that we're seeing is like, oh. He's making sure they have guys who can play some defense. Yeah. Because BYU was top – they was top 14 in offense, Ken Palm, but they were top 60 in defense, which is not bad compared to what we did last year. Yeah. It's way better than what we did last year. But right. he also had limitations. Yeah. But, and that's where, to me, people got to look at stuff like that because it speaks to the preparedness that they take into account, right? They were prepared in games. Even though they was running out guys we would find at the YMCA from – uh, from uh, from the uh, uh, Mormon church down here in Lexington. A lot of those guys can hoop, yeah. but you'll find out the YMCA playing. You know what I'm saying? Not saying they were that that bad, but you get the gist of it. They weren't these guys. Right. You get Otega, good finish at the rim. He shot 38% off catch and shoot. So even though he's not considered like a great shooter, they know in the system it can work and he's going to, he gets downhill really good too. He can attack the basket. So you're going to see some stuff go up for him. Um, that same weekend, we got Andrew Carr. When Andrew Carr entered the portal wait for us, I immediately said on Twitter, I said, fit, quote tweet, bookmark it, fit. This is the guy I want the four. 6'11", 6'10", 37% from three with a lot of attempts, not just a few attempts, you know what I'm saying? Because people go out and say, this dude shot 35%, but he only made 23s. That's not him. He shoots a lot of threes, makes them. He's also 90 in the 91st percentile when it comes to scoring and cuts. So, again, 
he's spinning into the analytics of what they want to do and what they do in their offense. Also, another underrated passer. Um, but also, if you watch BYU play, they're big. They have at least one big who's like their guy who like they'll post up every now and then. It's not all the time, but every now and then they'll post up, space out the floor, let him go one on one. He's in the 96th percentile when it comes to post up scoring. So it tells you when he posts up, he scores at a very, very high rate. So again, they're factoring in all these things, man. All these things are factoring in. We got great Osibor on campus visiting, right? They felt really strong about him. He had the same agent as Amari Williams. They went to school together, played together. They were teammates, friends. They loved that we got energy car. Like it was looking good. Right. The numbers game came up, and pretty much, you know, Potem was like, three million is too much. We respect it, but like. If you still want to consider us at the end of it, please do. But if it's what you're looking for, we're okay. We'll, we'll take a step back. But also, we thought Brandon Williams was going to um, – Brandon Garrison was going to uh, – my bad – was going to Arkansas. And out of nowhere, he said he's going to Kentucky. Everybody's kind of like, uh, but great on, I was on campus. And at first, I thought it didn't affect me, but it actually did. Yeah. When that happened, they were really like, we we just won't pursue anymore. It's okay, because we're going to take all your visits. We have, you know, three bigs now. There's no reason to pursue this any further. Um, but even Brandon Williams, McDonald's all, former McDonald's All-American, it was his freshman year last year, um, 67% of the rim, good block rate, 73 percentile when it comes to uh, pick and roll. So, get another rim runner guy. He can finish over the left and the right. Um, but again, he played in the offense that necessarily didn't play to his strengths, right? It was very guard oriented and he was most like a cleanup guy. So he did a lot of that as well. Um, but he's considered possibly like the most natural talent guy on the team that pro scouts are anywhere from he could make a jump and be a first round pick next year, you know, that kind of thing with him. So to have him as a backup, after he just started at the power five level in the big 12 all years, freshman year. That's a good pick pick up. Then we got to Kobe Brea, which that whole ordeal, man, I don't know if you remember, but we was recruiting a guy named Aiden Mahaney. He's from, uh, he's from SM from SMU. I publicly on, on Twitter. So that y'all know this is not biased. And this is because we got Kobe Brea. You go back to my Twitter account. I am not the coach on Twitter. Follow me. You'll see you put in Aiden Mahaney's name. I was not for this guy. 6'2", 6'3", guy, not, ath not athletic. Can dribble a little bit, get a shot off a little bit in the whack. But I wasn't very high on it. Um, I felt we could do better than that. Well, between us and UConn, we were both recruiting Kobe Brea and, uh, and Aiden Mahaney. And Kobe Brea, again, another player who got calls from everybody in the country. He told everybody else, stop. I'm only going to look at Duke, Kentucky. North Carolina, Kansas, and UConn. Blue blood told me. It's what he said. When he first entered a guy who, uh, one of the guys said, hey, if he enters the portal, I would say Kentucky's a leader. But everything else was saying UConn, you know, Duke at one point. Yeah, that, I would you know, UConn. Yeah, man. Oh, he's offering, he's asking for this amount of money, which was a lot. He was not asking for that amount, amount of money, you know. Um, but essentially, Eddie Mahaney was on a visit. He went visit went well. It went so well that when he went on the UConn visit, he caught they called Pope and asked, would we match what UConn was given? Well, we knew Kobe Brayers, they're not gonna get both of them. Kobe Brayers on his way on campus right now. They said, Yaku, we're not gonna match. Boom. He commits to UConn. So Kobe Brayer fell in, I mean, I almost fell in our lap, even though we was already. In their eyes, we were the lead the whole entire time. Right. Kobe Brea, man, it's insane. His metrics are insane, dude. I'm talking about 97 percentile in scoring transition, the 100 percentile in like catch and shoot. Dude hit 100 threes on like 50 percent shooting, dude. Like I mean, he's 90 percentile like almost every single thing, every single thing, every single shooting metric. But they didn't run no plays for him. If you go watch his film, they didn't run a lot of stuff for him. It was kind of like that. He was just getting in the flow. Yeah, it was like it was it was funky because they had Deron Holmes who was the main guy for them, and another kid. Um, uh, what's his name? It's, it's Latino name, but he was good too. That 
you know, it was it was different. So in their eyes, in this offense, oh, he's gonna get his shots. He's gonna <laughs> he's gonna get a lot of good shots already because he was making a lot of shots off the dribble too. A lot of people don't realize that when people say we don't got no bucket getters, it makes me laugh because they equivalent like they they equal that out to someone being able to score a lot of points, which in essence it is. But you also have guys who were part of certain systems that that's just not what was going on. You only had a certain amount of shots, and he's one of them. Who he made a lot of shots off the dribble, man, from three. He can drive to the bucket. I think you're going to see that showcase a lot this year as well. And uh, so I'm really excited about him. Uh, hey, man, listen, man, I hate to do this, man, but uh, we running out of time, brother. Uh, we might yeah. have to do a two parter, man, because I definitely uh want to hear you uh finish going through the roster, man. Um, like I said, um, you know, I had been looking to you for all my information, man. I had to sit back and chill. Uh, so you've been my guy, man. I've been quietly just peeping things. Uh, but yeah, man, I can't wait to introduce you to my audience, man. But anyways, before I let you go, let them know where they can find you at, man. Yeah, man. Appreciate you having me on again once again, man. Uh, but I'm on Twitter mainly with I'm not the coach. It's one long word, no capital letters. Talking basketball, I talk a lot of Kentucky basketball, but I also talk just college basketball in general, other sports in general. I love the game. I love the culture, man. So I love chopping up. May throw a joke here, too. But we do some spaces, man. Y'all always welcome to come on there with us as we just chop it up about what's going on in world sports. Yes, sir, man. Uh, like I said, man, it's, it's actually uh, my birthday's on Thursday, so my wife's getting ready to take me out to dinner. So, But I told her, I, I said, man, I had to chop it up with Phil before I went to dinner, man. So I appreciate you, brother. And like I said, man, we, we might have to do a two-parter, uh, so I will keep in touch with you because I definitely want to uh, hear the rest of your thoughts on this roster, man. But I appreciate you, brother. Man, appreciate you, man.